2nd, 2020, the Select Budget Committee will now come to order. I am Teresa Mosqueda, Chair of the Select Budget Committee. It is 2.04 p.m. We will come back to order and proceed with items of business from our morning recessed agenda. Will the clerk please call the roll? Morales. Councilmember Morales. Here. Thank you. Here. Peterson. Here. Swant. Here. Strauss. Present. That should rest with the manager. Gonzalez. Here. Mayor. Herbold. Councilmember Juarez. Here. Lewis. Chair Mosqueda. Present. Seven present. Thank you, Madam Clerk and Councilmember Herbold and Lewis are excused for um, appointments. They will be joining us later and we'll let you know when they are back in uh, the meeting here with us. I want to thank all of you for joining us again. Um, and thanks to the um, city departments who are with us this afternoon. You are the final hurrah. We have been engaged in two and a half days of robust discussion on the mayor's proposed 2021 budget. And we're very excited to have um, with us today, folks first from the Seattle Department of Transportation. Madam Clerk, will you please read into the record item number three. Agenda item three, Seattle Department of Transportation for a briefing and discussion. Thank you very much. Director Zimbabwe, it's great to see you. And I know we also have members of your team here. Uh, Chris Castleman, also from SDOT. Again, thanks to Ben Noble for being with us this afternoon. If we have questions for him um, from the overall uh, city budget office perspective. Uh, we really appreciate your time. I, as you know, um, there's many pressing issues in the transportation and transit world. I'm gonna turn it over to council member Peterson who chairs our transportation committee uh, for some opening comments and then we'll turn it over to you, Director Zimbabwe. Thank you, council member Peterson. Thank you, Chair Mosqueda and welcome to everybody from the executive today. Um, as we see at all levels of government throughout our nation, the budget for our department of transportation is facing the reality of back-to-back -back budget deficits as transportation revenue sources drop dramatically due to the COVID pandemic and the related economic recession. In light of the budget deficits, I know Director Zimbabwe and his executive team of transportation experts at SDOT have been working hard to prioritize our investments to make the hard choices of where to trim expenses, pause projects, all the while giving extra attention to things like the West Seattle Bridge. And despite temporary reductions elsewhere, I'm, I'm glad to see the mayor and SDOT striving to maintain funding levels for maintenance of our city's aging bridges, similar to the 2020 investment levels. However, it's important to remind everybody that our city auditor's recent report on all bridges throughout our city calls for substantially more spending on bridge maintenance to keep them safe and functional. I appreciate SDOT concurring generally with the auditor's recommendations on this need. Uh, therefore, if there are any opportunities to increase or change SDOT's budget between now and when the council adopts it, uh, for example, if the revenue forecast improves or we find savings elsewhere in the budget, I would hope to see more dollars go into bridge maintenance so that we truly acknowledge the alarming wake-up call from the sudden closure of the West Seattle Bridge and now the, the recognition of the poor condition of several other city bridges. I'll have questions about SDOT's budget throughout our process, but I do believe SDOT's off to a sensible and solid start in dealing with our fiscal constraints. I believe SDOT is doing their best to keep people and freight moving, to encourage transit to benefit our environment and those who rely on transit, and to keep pedestrians safe throughout our city. I look forward to hearing from SDOT today as they summarize their 2021 operating and capital budget proposal. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair Peterson. Um, and again, thank you, um, Director Zimbabwe. It's great to have you and your team here. We'll turn it back over to you. Thank you. Um, I'll give a little bit of an opening. Uh, Chris Castleman, who is our uh, uh, Finance and Administrative uh, Division Director, will talk through some of the details of the budget, and then I'll come back at the end to talk uh, some of the conclusions. Um, as always, 
uh, if, if you have questions, uh, feel free to interrupt uh, and ask at any point as we go through this presentation. Um, as we all can acutely understand, the, the mayor's uh, 2021 proposed budget comes during a series of challenges for the city, a global pandemic, an economic recession, a civil rights reckoning, devastating wildfires exacerbated by climate change, a continued housing crisis and infrastructure challenges in our city have all combined to make this budget unlike any other in our history. All of these challenges are significant on their own, let alone at the same time. Uh, SDOT also faces significant budget challenges due to the COVID-19 pandemic and specific declining revenues. The majority of projects uh, nonetheless may remain on track. Um, our approach to meeting the current budget shortfall recognizes that revenue will recover as the economy does, uh, and there's a great deal of uncertainty of exactly when and how that will happen. So to the greatest extent possible, we have built flexibility into our choices, understanding that as revenue becomes available, we may have the opportunity to scale back up our investments on these critical needs. We want to be clear eyed, however, about the immediate challenges before us in 2021 and beyond. We in Seattle are an exceptional city, but we're not an exception when it comes to the staggering impacts that COVID-19 has had and continues to have on our economy, uh, just like all cities large and small across the country. As the council knows, since March 2020, uh, our economy has been hit again and again. Uh, and this is these are not levels of impact that can be tweaked at the margin, especially when it comes to some of the transportation specific revenue sources. It requires hard decisions across the board and with real consequences and impacts. Uh, in many ways, this is acutely so for SDOT in 2021, we're facing significant declines in projected revenues. M as we move into 2021, our funding gap uh, was anticipated to be $85 million. Although the financial challenges and uncertainty required us to make difficult decisions, the actions we took in 2020 and proposed to take in 2021 should prevent deeper cuts in the future. For some context, uh, SDOT is funded by a variety of state and local funding sources, many of which have re restricted uses. We also rely on federal and regional grants and local partnerships to support many of our capital projects. Uh, SDOT's local revenues have and continue to decline rapidly as a result of the economic pressures created by the pandemic, and there is increasing uncertainty about the future of state funding levels. And so we are facing historic shortfalls, shortfalls in funding sources across the board. Um, we've made some hard decisions through 2020 as we work to rebalance our 2020 budget in the wake of COVID. We froze sp spending, paused or delayed projects and spent down one time revenue sources to limit the impacts to our projects and programs while remaining uh, while maintaining existing staffing levels. Uh, nonetheless, we still faced hard choices about which bodies of work would be paused. And in June, we shared that we did not expect an economic recovery to be swift and that projects may need to be added or removed from our uh, uh, pause list. And these challenges carry forward with us into 2021. Our key sources of revenue are, are sensitive to both an up and down economy and have not improved as we prepared our 2021 budget. Um, in all instances, it would be incumbent upon us to identify how we allocate those fewer resources in ways to meet the demands of the, these challenging times. As we center the needs of BIPOC communities and address our own ongoing asset uh, maintenance, maintenance needs across our portfolio, it's ever more important. One way we will be uh, seeking uh, input from communities across the, the city is through the Move Seattle levy assessment process, which is a review of our uh, original levy commitments uh, as we pass the midpoint of that levy in conjunction with the levy oversight committee. And, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later as well. Uh, we'll also need to continue to prioritize resources for emerging needs like our COVID-19 response, efforts to support small businesses throughout Seattle and the West Seattle High Rise Bridge and related Reconnect West Seattle efforts. Feedback from stakeholders and the public will play an important role in shaping our path forward. But to get to the point of this proposed budget, all of our decisions were filtered through a core values framework that has and will continue to guide SDOT through these choppy waters. These include uh, engaging in an equity-centered recovery process to minimize direct impacts to vulnerable and un underserved communities. Uh, as a city and as a department, we have underinvested in many of our BIPOC communities historically. The Black Lives Matter movement, the disparate impacts of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic from a health and economic perspective on BIPOC communities and our commitment to RSJI uh, means that we must take an ex equity lens to all of our budget decisions. We must ensure that our transportation system meets the needs of our communities of color and those of all incomes, ages, and abilities. To that end, our goal is to partner with communities to build a racially equitable and socially just transportation system. 
While budget reductions impact all Seattleites, it's my commitment to work to address historic disparities in BIPOC communities, including authentic engagement about emerging issues and longstanding needs. The proposed budget retains a commitment to the transportation equity work group, and there will continue to be a community dialogue around transportation equity and how transportation is an important component to community health and safety. We need to be able to engage in this dialogue, be transparent about how and why traditional investments are changing with an equity lens and remain nimble in how we deploy our transportation investments to meet community needs as part of the citywide conversation in partnership with BIPOC communities. The second value is preserving SDOT capacity for rapid recovery efforts. This maintains our ability to respond to our emerging needs, drive economic re recovery efforts, and move rapidly with our ongoing West Seattle Bridge mitigation efforts and other issues as they emerge. Our third is to maintain public safety. Maintaining safety for the traveling public is a top priority for us at SDOT. Through our asset maintenance, capital project delivery, and Vision Zero programs, SDOT is responsible for the safety of everyone in our transportation system. And we need to continue investing in all of our infrastructure. Within this broader context comes the critical consideration of bridge operations and maintenance, as Councilmember Peterson uh, said before. This was underscored in the recent and helpful report by the Seattle Office of the City Auditor on vehicle bridges in the city. There's a critical need for new bridge maintenance funding consistent with previous SDOT assess assessments. Until we work at all levels of government to find scalable, sustainable solutions, this will continue to be a key challenge that cannot be resolved without new resources and taking into consideration SDOT's citywide infrastructure maintenance and public safety operations. The next value is to continue our fight against climate change by prioritizing our multimodal investments. Even amid tough economic times and reduced revenues, we cannot fail to make progress in our fight against climate change. Transportation is the number one contributor to greenhouse gas emissions in Seattle, and we will continue to prioritize investments that lower carbon emissions from this sector. The next value is maximizing federal and state funding opportunities. We need to retain our readiness to secure grants and our eligibility for other programs that leverage our investments as a city. And the last of those values is maintaining funding and flexibility within our larger transportation and mobility focused programs. We've chosen to postpone discrete capital projects while retaining funding in programs that deliver on our commitments and priorities and maintain basic services throughout the city. Despite the economic headwinds, we want to be very clear the city and SDOT will be very busy in 2021 delivering on many projects and reaching critical milestones along the way. Despite the pandemic, we've continued to deliver in every way possible while facing competing priorities born of the pandemic, the West Seattle high rise bridge closure and limited staff resources as many of our high risk individuals were unable to perform their normal duties. Uh, these can be these successes can be seen across town. We've got the Lander Street overpass, which will open next week. Significant progress on the Northgate pedestrian bicycle bridge and the Fairview bridge replacement, safety and transit improvements on Rainier Avenue South, new sidewalks and pavement on North 40th and North 50th streets as part of uh, Green Lake and Wallingford multimodal improvements and Northeast Pacific Street next to UW uh, Medical Hospital. We've completed seismic retrofit work on the Cow Cowan Park Bridge and have uh, similar efforts on the Howe Street Bridge wrapping up this winter. We started construction on the Dell Ridge Rapid Ride H corridor. We've cleared federal readiness requirements on the Madison BRT corridor. We recently cons completed construction on the first phase of, a, of the Fourth Avenue protected bike lane. And this is just a few of the successes that we've had as a department. The reality is that we need to continue our investment in the transportation system, uh, despite the things that are outside of our control. In the coming weeks and months, there are important areas where we can have uh, some control and, and be very intentional in our, at, in our actions. The levy assessment process is, is one of those uh, where we'll be able to reevaluate how to have the best possible impact with the resources we have left and continue to center equity in the remaining years of the current levy. We also have the choice of, to be intentional about setting the stage for securing the scalable and sustainable resources and progressive revenue tools we need uh, to deliver on all the commitments we have as a department and as a city. As, a, as the fastest growing city of the last decade, we have a lot of catching up to do. Um, and this is highlighted again by the, the report of the city auditor on our need for continued investment in our bridges. Um, at the same time as the, the pandemic has impacted all of our revenue stream. Um, the fact that the uh, initiative 976, which further limits those revenue streams potentially makes clear that we need to have conversations in both Washington DC and Olympia about sustainable, scalable sources of revenue and additional local authorities to fund our transportation system. 
before I move on and turn it over to Chris, and I am getting to the to the end of this introduction, uh, I'd like to talk briefly about the proposed transfer of parking enforcement functions to SDOT. Um, this represents over 120 hardworking women and men who have many skills and talents. We've already been had a good working relationship between our curbside management team and the parking enforcement officers, uh, and there's so many synergies and opportunities by bringing the policy development and implementation closer together as well as seeing how the role of parking enforcement officers can be broadened in support of the SDOT mission as a whole. Uh, I support the, uh, I and the rest of um, SDOT are excited about the opportunities this, this potential transfer uh, presents. So we've talked about a lot of big challenges, ones that uh, we can choose to, to tackle together. And I look forward to doing that with you all uh, and the community to map an, out an equitable, inclusive, and impactful path forward in 2021 and beyond. With that, I will turn it over to uh, Chris Castleman to talk through some of the detailed elements of our budget, and then I'll talk, come back at the end to talk about uh, a few other items. And again, if there's any questions at this point or at any point in the future, please feel free. Thank you, Sam, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, may I ask that the presentation please come up? All that's coming up, I just want to say, Director Zimbabwe, thank you for your opening comments. Thank you as well, Councilmember Peterson. Uh, Director Zimbabwe, I, I just want to note that your comments um, are by far um, sort of the most inclusive of the uh, reckoning that we currently have right now. And I really appreciate the way in which you've underscored how COVID, uh, the economic crisis, and our infrastructure crisis are all interwoven. So thank you for your opening comments and for really connecting the dots on all of those pieces. Very well said. Thank you. Don't see your presentation yeah, yet. I, Don't I either. I can, I can, I think I can try to bring it up as well. It'd be great um, if we can share permission with Director Zimbabwe to share his screen. That'd be better than me doing it. Wonderful. Oh, Thank you very much. How does that look? Perfect. OK. Thank you, Sam. Sure. Multi-talented. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, so again, good afternoon, council members. Um, Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity to go through what's happening with SDOT's budget, both in 2020 and also in 21. I'll be looking a little bit in this direction because this is where my notes are. So I apologize if I'm not looking directly in the camera, but I think you're probably all looking at the slide deck. Uh, so I'll be walking you through the high level view of our proposed budget, including key changes to our budget and CIP and other noteworthy items and I'll be speaking directly from the slides that you have in front of you. Uh, for the general fund, this slide demonstrates the significant general fund reduction SDOT took this year during the 2020 rebalancing effort, largely to help the city balance declining revenues due to COVID-19 impacts. You'll see that our 2020 revised general fund appropriation is 25% lower than the 2020 adopted. However, in the 2021 proposed budget, SDOT's general fund appropriation has a $15.8 million increase, which isn't called out specifically on this slide, but you'll see it on the next slide. And this is due to the transfer of the parking enforcement function from SBD to SDOT. This increase is partially offset by yet additional general fund reductions that are needed once again in support of the city's overall balancing efforts for 2021. In other appropriations, the 2020 revised other appropriation number is not an apples to apples comparison with either the adopted or the proposed views. This is because SDOT's revised 2020 budget includes capital carry forward beyond the current year adopted budget. Specifically, the net $319 million increase in 2020 revised other includes a 227, excuse me, $277 million carry forward of 2019 capital funding, $13 million in new funding for a variety of capital projects, and also a $44 million reduction in budgets related to COVID-19 and other small adjustments. I want to point out that this overall change is in fact inclusive of $73 million allocated to the West Seattle, but uh, excuse me, West Seattle Bridge program immediate response. 
Overall for the department, you'll note that we do have an FTE increase. Uh, this is due to the transfer of the FTE coming over from SPD, 123 in total, including indirect support positions. Uh, a transfer of a position from the Office of Intergovernmental Relations and the abrogation of three vacant positions in SDOT. Next slide, thank you. All right, so Is in these- my, I'm Yes. So sorry, Chris, just on the overall budget, um, Councilmember Peterson, are there any comments or anything else that you'd like to lift up here? Thank you for asking, Chair Mosqueda. No, it's just the, um, I appreciate them highlighting the complexity of trying to compare apples to apples. It is, it's hard with the, uh, um, that carry forward and then the, uh, the parking enforcement folks coming in. And, and so I appreciate them explaining, walking folks through that. Thank okay. you. Excellent. Thank you. Right. So the next three slides will touch upon some of the more significant significant changes to SDOT's budget in 2021. And I want to draw your attention to one thing right from the start. Please note that where asterisks are shown in the FTE change column, we are highlighting for your awareness that there could be staffing impacts associated with that particular budget change that are not reflected through actual FTE changes. But we do expect to be able to manage those staffing impacts within our existing position authority. All right, so parking enforcement, Sam already mentioned it, as did Council Member Peterson. Uh, so this parking enforcement, item number one in the general fund, this change reflects the transfer of the parking enforcement program from SPD to SDOT. Included in the transfer are all direct and indirect costs associated with the program. In addition, Many parking enforcement officers provide traffic control support for special events. And so within this number is $800,000 of overtime for special events that's also transferred to SDOT. As I already mentioned, the change includes the transfer of 123 FTE from SPD to SDOT. Item number two, the West Seattle Bridge Program. Earlier this summer, the council passed legislation creating the West Seattle Bridge Capital Improvement Program. The proposed appropriation of 30.5 million that you see on this slide to the CIP program in 2021 funds emergency repairs and bridge stabilization work for the West Seattle High Bridge that may include shoring and or controlled removal bridge replacement options, analysis, and design. It also includes funding for repairs and enhancements to the Spokane Swing Bridge or Low Bridge. In addition, this CIP program funds Reconnect West Seattle, a broad multimodal strategy to accommodate cross Duwamish travel that formerly used the High Rise Bridge. While this program does not, so this is the first one with the asterisk, while this program does not result in the creation of new FTE, there are positive changes for staff positions as they shift from work that may no longer be funded elsewhere in the department to work that supports this program. All right, moving on to item number three, the Seattle Transportation Benefit District, otherwise known as STBD. In November 2014, voters approved the SDPD Proposition 1, which provides a $60 vehicle license fee and a 0.1% sales tax to purchase enhanced transit service from King County Metro, support low income transit access programs, and provide low income vehicle license fee rebates. STBD also funds the ORCA Opportunity Program and limited transit capital investments. This measure expires on December 31st, as you all know, and so this change removes the associated budget from SDOT's baseline operating budget. As a result of your action earlier this summer, a new initiative will be considered by voters this November to go into effect on January 1st, should it pass. That proposal will include funding for King County Metro service, transit-related capital improvements, transit access programs, and 
other emerging needs. If approved by the voters, the new revenues will need to be appropriated and budget authority established for SDOT to provide these programs and services. And so a future supplemental action would be necessary. This also has an asterisk. And the reason for that is that SDOT has allocated staffing resources to the existing measure in support of the program and the services that it provides. In the event that the new measure passes, staffing resources will be dedicated to support the new program. Chris, just really quickly on that um, last slide, uh, specifically as it relates to the Seattle Transportation Benefits District, you mentioned that we will need to have supplemental budget action depending on the outcome of uh, Proposition 1. Um, do you have a sense of um, whether that will need to occur in, in December, for example, or are we looking at first quarter of 2021? Well, I believe that the, well, uh, so, and Director Noble can correct me if I misstate this, but first, of course, we have to wait for the results of the election to be certified. And then, because the change would be for the 2021, it would be a change to the 2021 adopted budget, that would have to be accomplished through a uh, supplemental in 2021. I don't believe that the Council can amend the 2020, 2021 adopted budget in the current year, in the current calendar year. Ben, did I get that right? I'm actually not sure it's a technical point. I, mean, I think the, I think there won't be any harm in waiting till the first part of next year. Um, alternatively, we may have, um, depending on the clarity or not of the initial results, have, have a clear sense of where things are headed. But um, uh, in any, in any sense, I, I don't think there'll be, uh, we can sort out the detail in time. I don't think there'll be, there'll be an issue in accomplishing it in, in time to uh, ensure that uh, there's no issue with service or anything like that. Yeah. So, so in other words, for, for purposes of our, of our budget exercise this fall, um, we don't need to uh, change course or accommodate our budgeting process to, uh, based on um, whatever results um, come out of uh, this fall's election cycle. I, I, that's sort of what I'm trying to, to, to suss out here, right? Because what we'll likely know the results of the um, election and likely have certification before the final vote on um, the 2021 budget. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's accurate. I mean, we, you know, could try to rush in a, to amend that document, but I don't think that'll be necessary. Um, I know that won't be necessary and we'll have an opportunity to, to take it up afterwards. I, I don't know whether we'll be in a position to prepare those amendments, even if you'd, if you'd wanted to move on them. We can, we can work that out. Great, just wanted to get a, a, a sense of that. Um, in terms of process. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you for that question. It's a good one. All right. Uh, so moving on to item number four, TNC or Transportation Network Company Tax Revenues. Sorry, something popped up on my screen. TNC tax revenues are estimated to be significantly lower than once planned and SDOT has had to pause many projects originally slated to be funded by those revenues. This has resulted in staffing, in changes to staffing plans throughout the department, but as before, we're able to mitigate that within existing position authority. These revenues exist within the general fund, which is why the general fund is noted in that box. And the change shown on this slide reflects the net decrease to funding appropriations for those projects as a result of the, dec the projected decline in revenues. However, it's important to note that $1.2 million of TNC funding is proposed to be pro programmed for four capital projects in 2021. Those are West Marginal Way improvements that are associated with the West Seattle Bridge Immediate Response CIP project, freight spot improvements, bike master plan protected bike lane projects, and Vision Zero pedestrian improvement projects. In addition, as Sam mentioned in his opening remarks, $300,000 of TNC revenues are proposed to provide continuing support to SDOT's transportation equity work. As noted in the budget book narrative, these funds will be available only after city, other city obligations are met. 
Those include funding fixed costs for TNC tax, imp tax implementation and administration in the Department of Finance and Administrative Services and the Office of Labor Standards, the paying back of interfund loans for 2020 expenditures, and funding the Dispute Resolution Center. All right, item number five. Um, I'm so sorry, I'll, I'll come back to it. I have a question on number four, but I'll let's get through this slide and then we'll take questions on the full slide. Okay, okay. thank you, Councilman Rizal. Well. Got Councilman number Strauss as well in the lineup. Item number five, the streetcar. COVID-19 impacts to the city's revenue and also to transit use have led to the need to reduce the frequency of service, the number of train cars, and the hours of streetcar operation for the two existing streetcar lines in South Lake Union and First Hill. The reduction is 10%, the reduction in service levels, I should say, is 10% lower than the January 2020 service levels. This change does result in the elimination of four operator positions at King County Metro, all of which are currently vacant. In addition, due to uncertain revenue forecasts in the funds anticipated to support project implementation, the Center City Connector or the C3 streetcar project is paused with the current project budget moved to outside the current budget framework. I'll continue. Item number six, rapid ride C and D lines. As part of Sound Transit's ST3 program, improvements to the C and D rapid, line, rapid ride lines are part of the early deliverable commitments. SDOT and Metro have worked with Sound Transit to identify improvements, a delivery strategy, and a funding agreement to advance this work that will begin in 2021. We are excited to move forward with the project this revenue-based work allows us to reallocate staff from other paused projects to support the Rapid Ride C and D line project. Thank you very much, Chris. And uh, Councilmember Strauss, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Chair Mosqueda, uh, and thank you, Chris and Director Zimbabwe. My question is on item number four uh, regarding TNC revenue specifically on subsection two and subsection three and subsection four, freight spot improvement program, bike master plan, protected bike lanes, and vision zero pedestrian improvement projects. Um, have these specific projects been identified at this time? Uh, if so, feel free to sh follow up with me offline. Um, I'd be interested to know how we are improving the freight mobility throughout our city um, and protecting and creating bike um, protected bike lanes. And I'll take this opportunity to also share my thanks for the 4th Avenue protected bike lane. Thank you. Sure, so, um, you know, those are all existing programs where that were supported by some of the revenues where we've seen uh, reductions. So this would be um, adding funds back in to replace some of those uh, displaced revenues. And so using the same program prioritization efforts uh, within those existing programs. And we're happy to follow up with some more specifics as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I don't see any other hands. I'm gonna jump in if there's no other council members with questions. Um, so my question relates to uh, item number four here on slide three, uh, the proposed budget moves TNC tax funds to support the transportation equity program. The proposal notes that these funds can't be spent until TNC tax proceeds are spent to A, fund TNC tax implementation and administration at FAS and OLS and um, pay back interfund loans for 2020 expenditures. And finally, to fund the dispute resolution center but what, if any, impacts could there be to the transportation equi equity program? Um, what would the impact be um, on this type of swap? So, um, you know, this, this we had anticipated um, revenues coming in in 2020 that, that didn't materialize um, 
uh, I think if as we move into 2021, if if the revenue projections um, continue to to you know fluctuate or we don't anticipate um, the amount that we're currently anticipating, uh, we would have to look for other ways to continue that transportation equity work, um, including. Um, I mean, that there's there's other ways for us to do that through our existing department overhead or, or other ways to potentially accomplish that. But um, I think that's a that 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 remains a core priority and, and value of ours, uh, supporting that equity work group. That group is is working on a uh, work collaboratively with the SDOT team on a transportation equity agenda. Um, and uh, I think the the work of that group continues to be a, a, a important and a priority. Thank you. Uh, Director Noble, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? No, I just, um, just to say that it's not really a swap. It's, it's more a question of what resource is available from this, um, from this funding source to dedicate to that purpose. And just being very clear that we're going to do all the other things that are mentioned here first, and then the next dollar beyond those, those firm commitments to the regulatory and implementation side would go to SDOT. Um, but you raise a good point, and, and as the directors have always described it, and if those revenues don't emerge, we have to, um, and we wanted to pursue the work, we have to uh, consider how to reprioritize other resources to, to the purpose. Okay, thank you very much, uh, both directors. Uh, let's go ahead and move on. Thank you. All right. Item number seven, the Move Seattle Levy portfolio. We are pleased that Move Seattle Levy property tax proceeds remain relatively stable this year and are projected to remain so in 2021. But local funds within the 2021 Move Seattle Levy portfolio have been reduced, reflecting reduced revenue projections for SDOT across the board. This slide shows the year to year change. And it so it essentially shows the changes in local funds. The next two slides after this, which Sam will speak to in a few minutes, show the Move Seattle budget for the remaining four years of the levy. For 2021 through 2024, local funds are reduced from the portfolio by a total of $71.6 million projected at this point. We'll get to that in more detail in a few minutes. Although the change is a significant reduction, we've been able to mitigate impacts to staff who work on levy funded programs and projects by implementing a hiring freeze, reallocating staff to other programs and projects, and by bringing additional work in-house rather than using outside vendors. Item number eight, bridge maintenance. This item refers to ongoing bridge maintenance activities in SDOT's O&M budget. We wanted to call out that our investment in this important work is unchanged, except for a small inflationary increase. And then finally, item number nine, Madison BRT. This slide shows the additional funding needed to support the Madison Street Bus Rapid Transit Project or BRT, also known as the Rapid Ride G Line in 2021. Last week, this council approved an updated CIP and funding plan for Madison BRT. In addition, the Sound Transit Board of Directors approved the city's funding agreement with Sound Transit for the project. Finally, SDOT has now completed the remaining elements needed to receive a small starts grant from the Federal Transit Agency. Pending the execution of the grant agreement, the project is anticipated to begin construction in 2021. Are there any questions on this slide? Not seeing any hands. Um, I do want to ask on item number seven with the move Seattle levy. Obviously, when we see a 69% reduction, it's very concerning. Um, I understand that it reflects the reality of the revenue projections for that specific levy. Um, is there any chance that these projections were done, you know, three, four weeks ago and given the news at the state level that we can anticipate uh, less dire projections since the state revenue forecast is slightly better than anticipated? I know Director Noble spoke a little bit to our overall revenue projections at the city um, since we're largely 
uh, depending on regressive um, streams, but specific to Moose Seattle Levy, any any hope there? Well, there's always hope. I, I will let Sam <laughs> respond to your question, but I will point out that yes, you're correct. Uh, this budget proposal was developed over the course of the summer and was finalized uh, really, you know, in August and in September. And so all of the numbers that you're, you see about our projected revenues, ref, you know, are from a particular point in time in the prior month. Let me take a couple swipes at that and I'll also let Director Noble uh, answer if he wants to about the timing of, of any revised projections that might be used. Um, the just one thing to clarify here, the 59% reduction is in the non levy local dollars that go into the levy program and are leveraged. So our, our levy, the, the, the levy dollars themselves leverage local dollars, uh, as well as other uh, other grant funding sources. Um, to comprise the whole of the levy program. So this 59% re represents the reduction in the levy uh, dollars that are part of the anticipated um, uh, program in 2021 as from the 2020 adopted. Um, it is a significant impact and a lot of those, uh, and, and I can actually, if I, it might be good to transition here, I can always come back. Um, but this sort of shows the 21 through 24 through the remaining life of the levy, um, the overall impact that we anticipate, um, which maybe is a little bit less dire than is is shown, you know, from that 59% uh, reduction there. Um, we do anticipate um, a little bit uh, more $60.7 million or 7.5% or of the overall levy program uh, to be reduced over the course of a four-year period, um, and uh, and what we've done is to um, th this shows the those reductions in the context of the three Moose Seattle levy categories: safe routes, maintenance and repair, and congestion relief. Um, uh, this the following slide. Um, this one here shows those as. Uh, proportion of the dollars that are make up part of the, the levy. And so we have the levy dollars at the bottom. Those are, remain consistent. Those are the, the baseline funds. And we have not seen a, a substantial change in the projections there. The light blue is the local funds. Those are the ones that have seen the most impact. Uh, those are um, a combination of different funding sources that are transportation uh, specific primarily. Um, the next is the leverage and you see a large portion of the purple actually growing over the course of the baseline to the proposed and that is reflective of our grant funding sources, which we keep as uh, to be determined not to be considered with transportation benefit district. The TBD is to be determined in the levy context. Um, we keep those as to be determined until they are secured or very likely to be secured. Um, and so that is uh, the shift that you see there from um, baseline to proposed. Um, so overall, the impact on the levy program as a whole comes from the decline in those local uh, local sources. Um, and I think as if, if recovery takes a different path than we've projected at this point, um, we can take steps to, to um, reallocate those to the levy programs where we're, where we're taking reductions right now. Director Zimbabwe, thank you for that. Um, Councilmember Peterson, I'm not sure if, uh, if, if you had other things to add there. I'm sorry for my confusion on this. I think uh, I just jumped to the conclusion that it was related to reduction in uh, levy levy funds, but you've clearly pointed out this is non-levy funds. Your slide says that. So if it's coming from other local funds, is, does that mean that it's more of a policy choice? Um, I, I, go ahead, Sam. Uh, well, I was going to say that. It, uh, so the, um, you know, the levy program as a whole goes to uh, it, it takes the, those levy dollars and then um, puts in those those local funds to um, uh, to deliver on the overall program. Uh, so as the local funds have those funding, those revenues of have, have projections go down, um, we uh, have taken you know, we, we're taking the reductions in the overall program. I, there is a policy decision and a, a, something that is in the uh, proposed budget is to bring forward some of the uh, dollars that we anticipate later in the levy uh, to minimize the short-term impact of some of these local dollar reductions. And so um, because the levy is a, is a stable 
funding source, um, and we have some, um, you know, resources that we anticipate coming through uh, for projects that have not yet begun or are not ready to advance yet, uh, that were anticipated for later in the in the levy, pulling those resources forwards into into 2021 uh, will help us keep the levy program um, moving at the same speed it was moving at r roughly uh, while we uh, see what happens into the future with our with our revenues. And so that is something that is reflected in the in the budget as a small um, pull forward of our of our resources bonding against future revenues. Thank you. All right, um, I will move on and again, happy to answer questions on, on any part of the, the budget. But one thing we wanted to touch on is how uh, the department, uh, I, I addressed it in some of the opening remarks, but how our uh, department budget uh, uh, addresses racial equity um, and as a as a as, as I said before as a city and as a department uh, we've underinvested in many of our BIPOC communities and the Black Lives Matter movement the disparate impacts um, of uh, from a health and economic perspective uh, and our commitment to RSJI really mean that we have to take an equity lens to all of our budget decisions um, and we are keenly aware that the budget decisions we make directly impact racial equity both internally and in the communities that we serve uh, we've been mindful in our proposals to minimize the direct impacts to vulnerable and underserved communities with our project pauses in particular uh, and looking at, at where the where those uh, projects are we've chosen to uh, where it's possible to pause larger discrete capital projects so that we are able to uh, deliver on programmatic work that has a far-reaching and positive impact on all Seattle communities, but also enables us to focus on how our efforts can better serve BIPOC communities. Um, we do program level racial equity analyses in determining how to deliver projects and maintenance activities and our, our modal plans guiding investments for people walking, rolling, biking, taking transit uh, and delivering freight supporting that support equitable prioritization. Um, we also anticipate that as SDOT engages in dialogue with communities, particularly BIPOC communities around transportation needs in the post COVID-19 recovery process, we'll be able to further refine our priorities and investments. Um, and one way that that is happening is through an assessment of the final four years of delivery under the, the levy to move Seattle. Um, that's something that we're engaging with the levy oversight committee uh, right now. There are some impacts to uh, the proposed budget, the potential impacts to communities and users, um, you know, reducing capital projects to build out our infrastructure as well as reductions to service levels or transportation services could reduce the opportunities for various communities and travelers to keep or gain better access to safer and more effective transportation modes citywide. Um, and these programmatic resources can be focused on geographic locations with a race and social justice lens, but impacts to these programs and resources overall could likely further affect those who have traditionally been underserved. Even if we're targeting resources towards uh, underserved communities, people travel across the city and, and uh, those impacts tend to fall dis disproportionately uh, um, on, on the community. Uh, there's potential impacts to WIMBY vendors um, utilizing women and minority owned business enterprises is one of the ways that SDOT and the city operationalize our commitment to equity. Um, just this week, I, I got an update on our progress towards our goals that we set for ourselves at the beginning of the year. Um, we set a 34% a WIMBY utilization rate for consulting and a 19% WIMBY utilization for purchasing. Uh, through the end of August, we had a, we're slightly exceeding our, our consulting uh, goal with 36.7 of our spending going to Wimby firms, but not meeting our goal for purchasing, uh, which is a little bit under 15% thus far in this year. Um, we also take a, a racial equity look at that as well. And um, we know that we need to deepen the, uh, the racial equity proportion of that. We do very well with our women owned businesses. We have, a, we struggle more uh, with minority owned businesses. Uh, as we pause or reduce some capital or asset repair projects, um, those could reduce opportunities for local and regional WIMBY contractors who participate in project delivery, uh, from public engagement to design to construction, as well as in our material supply or services. And a downstream effect, a downstream effect of our efforts to preserve the SDOT workforce and workforce diversity internally could mean that as we shift some capital project work from consultants to SDOT staff and crews, um, uh, we could continue, we could have some of those impacts on the, the Wimby vending community as well. Um, we have some uh, potential impact to our, our citywide uh, capacity for uh, planning and racial equity analysis as we look at uh, 
the resources needed for planning, data gathering, analysis, uh, policy, legislative support, and uh, environmental impact analysis. Um, uh, we think those are those can be mitigated, but those are places where some of the reductions overall and how we we need to implement those uh, and, and keep some of our infrastructure investment work going. Uh, and we're, we're very mindful about not hampering our long term uh, ability to, to advance those critical uh, priorities as well. Um, and then we um, we've managed to minimize the impact uh, internally to our staffing levels, um, but we still need to take action as a department to attract and retain uh, a diverse and inclusive workforce. And, and there's a number of things that we've uh, we've done and we continue to do in working across the department for our uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, advancement, um, uh, and, and building the diversity of our team as a whole. I'll talk uh, briefly about our support for small businesses. Um, and there's been a lot that we have done over the course of the COVID response uh, and a lot that um, we still anticipate happening over the course of this year and into next year. Uh, we've adapted and modified and streamlined our tools to be nimble and innovative and help our Seattle businesses survive. Uh, within f uh, on March 17th, so very, very early on in the, in the pandemic, we launched food priority pickup zones at restaurants and we have them at 531 uh, locations. Um, in May, we launched the curbside priority pickup zones for retail. We have those at 64 locations and we made those easy for, for um, businesses to request and for us to deploy. Uh, when we lifted, when the stay home, stay healthy orders were lifted in June, we started offering free six month permits for curbside and sidewalk uses. Um, we've, uh, um, we've approved 140 permits, we have more under review. Um, a lot of those are focused on food and you can see one in the picture here in the background there, um, that's uh, Island Time, or sorry, Island Soul Street Cafe um, in, in Columbia City. Uh, in um, in August, the Seattle Together Streets program began piloting temporary, temporarily closing blocks and providing signs, tables, and chairs uh, to support takeout in uh, Lake City, Columbia City, Othello, and um, soon in the uh, CID um, for a mural installation. Um, and the the uh, we've linked these block closures uh, to our Stay Healthy Streets and worked in partnership with some of the uh, the communities to, to be able to take advantage of, of this asset as well. Um, we've made our, in, in an effort to make our programs more accessible, this information is available in multiple languages, uh, promoted through ethnic media outlets, and we are doing phone consultations with businesses uh, to support in their, uh, applica in, in their applications. And lastly, we've partnered with OED to support the small gr business grants process that they've, um, they've been administering over the course of this year. So that brings us to the end of the the presentation as a whole, I'm happy to take any more questions. Thank you again, uh, Director Zimbabwe. Thank you, Chris, for your presentation as well. I know on that last slide, there was a lot of enthusiasm for the street um, sidewalks and uh, street vacancies to be able to go into effect. So excited to see that slide. Uh, Councilmember Pearson, I'll turn it over to you first. Councilmember Morales, would you like to speak as well? Yes, I just have a comment to make. Excellent. And I see Councilmember Strauss as well. Councilmember Peterson, anything from you before we kick off? Thank you. Okay, excellent. Councilmember Morales, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Director Zimbabwe. I, I Careful out there. Right now. <laughs> uh, I am not driving. That wasn't at me. Um, I know what, uh, what a crunch uh, every department in the city is in, particularly yours. And so I appreciate the hard decisions that you are having to make um, about projects and program. And um, I do want to say, um, particularly when we're talking about um, uh, not just racial equity, but also just the ability of our um, uh, community members who have disabilities to be able to get around their neighborhoods and their cities. Um, it is really hard to see that so much of our um, our you know pedestrian and bike infrastructure plans have been cut. Um, and so I do want to say that you know, as you were saying, if there's any future opportunity to increase those investments, particularly if we're talking about the climate impacts, the the health impacts, that not um, not having 
alternative modes easily accessible, alternative modes of transportation easily accessible to people. Um, you know, you know, all these things are, are connected and tied together. And so I think it is uh, smart investments to be making in our neighbors for all kinds of reasons and would love to talk with you and be in touch about um, how we can make some adjustments uh, as soon as we know about resources that are available. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you, Council Member Morales. Um, I'm not sure the location, but perhaps we need a street diet where you're at. We could work on that uh, to slow down that traffic. Council Member Strauss, please go ahead. Thank you, Chair Mosqueda. Thank you, Director Zimbabwe. Uh, also, comments on slide eight and really very appreciative of the work that SDOT and the Executive's Office has done to create. Uh, cafe streets, Seattle together streets, um, and the use of our rights of way for us to be able to physically distance and also benefit the economy. I know that the cafe streets and the sidewalk, the extended sidewalk cafe permits were rolled out a little, uh, more than halfway through the summer. I'm wondering, do we have plans in place for this program to be extended into the winter and if there are specific policy parameters in, that we will be putting in place to assist folks uh, dealing with the, the winter time months, whether it's heaters, tents. I know that currently uh, businesses have to roll all of their uh, belongings back into their, um, their store at the end of the night. And I know that that can be diff more difficult and cumbersome as more implements are needed to protect people from um, rain, wind, cold, uh, et cetera. And then also just flagging, New York City has also done this and there's a French cafe that uses bubbles. If you haven't seen that article and the news coverage about the people dining in bubbles, I hope that we can see something like that here as well. Thank you, Director. Absolutely. So um, I think those are great questions and, and uh, we are working to address those as, as quickly as we can. I think one of the, um, uh, and, and so, you know, every business is slightly different um, and every business has slightly different needs. I think one of the things that was successful um, about the rollout of our, of our existing program is that uh, we've been able to, to support businesses through that process and, and um, you know, not have them try to sort of find the right the right rock and show it to us, uh, but be able to help them sort of coach them through that process. I think as we get into uh, overhead protection and, and heaters and things like that, that's a place where we want to be able to give really clear direction so that businesses aren't, in, aren't investing in things that um, end up not being approvable. Um, uh, I think we've also learned over the last uh, month or so about just how, how people are using the street and how we can continue to help support it. and. Um, one of the the places where we definitely have heard the feedback is that some people some people do want to bring their their things in overnight and some people don't and and how we can uh, help people continue to use the, the right of way um and um you know it's still the weather's still you know knock on wood pretty decent but we know that october tends to start raining here uh, and get get a little bit colder so we know that there's some urgency in in um in getting these issues resolved so we can give some clear direction to our businesses to keep keep doing what they're doing Thank you so much. Um, I have a question on this slide as well. For programming in response to COVID, such as um, the healthy streets or the street sidewalks, uh, can you speak to both the distribution of these um, sites, these locations, sort of the equity analysis that goes into this? And then we didn't talk a ton about the healthy streets, but recognizing the healthy streets were rolled out in neighbor neighborhood green ways which really, I think, limited the, the success of prioritizing communities of color and neighborhoods that need additional traffic calming measures. And we have a, a, a disparity in terms of where those greenways and traffic calming areas are. Can you talk about any other efforts that you are working on to expand beyond our existing model of using greenways and um, to try to make sure that we're including more neighborhoods that um, may need both traffic calming measures and flexible design strategies to not only um, 
I think that the concept, at least on the images, is you know a place to exercise while we were in the midst of COVID. But a lot of folks are using those areas as safer places to ride their bikes, as commuting strategies, or to walk um, to places of business. Uh, can you talk about the equity analysis that will go in or has gone into trying to expand beyond the existing um, street healthy street program? Yeah, uh, those are great questions. Um, so the existing programs, uh, I believe we're now at a, about 27 miles of stay healthy streets across the city. Uh, we did take a, an equity lens in identifying those neighborhood greenways that we would we would upgrade to those um, and try to find places that were underserved from a, um, a other sort of recreation or, or neighborhood access perspective. Um, one piece of feedback that we did get early on in the in the program is that the street closed um, language, uh, which is necessary because of the um, to for to allow pedestrians to walk in the street, we have to call the street closed. Um, uh, felt exclusionary, and especially in places that are experiencing uh, gentrification and displacement, um, people felt as though they might be uh, as, or had experiences of being uh, asked why they were on that block in a, in a car uh, or sort of um, uh, and, and so um, in some communities it was it, it had the potential to create some of the sort of things that were converse to what our intention was and so especially as we think about what it might mean to make some of those investments permanent and, and create that safe uh, walking and, and biking environment that you mentioned, um, we want to be really intentional about how we engage with community and, and don't end up with the unintended consequences that we did see in, in a couple of places. So um, uh, in terms of expanding those, um, we continue to make greenway investments. Uh, we continue to, to look at ways to continue to you know, expand that. We've also implemented um, some of the first home zone programs that I, I know has been a, a really important piece that the council has also funded in the past. Um, and, and so I think it's it's incumbent upon us to continue to work with communities through this and figure out how we, we uh, maintain access and also improve uh, safety for people walking and biking uh, as, as patterns of, of movement have also shifted radically. So people are trying to get to and from their local, um, local neighborhoods uh, walking and biking, maybe the commute downtown might be less important in some, in some, for some people in, in some parts of the city. Uh, thank you very much. That's helpful. Along a similar line of questioning for our slide five. Um, you know that we are dealing with the reality of uh, having to make tough decisions right now, um, absent all of the revenue that we need. But can you describe for us the process that went into identifying which projects within the Move Seattle um, portfolio would move forward and which ones were going to be put on hold. We got this question sort of through the framework of how did those projects get identified, which stakeholders were at the table, and then was there some sort of weight given to Vision uh, Zero projects or the city's climate um, priority projects? Yeah, that's another great question. So um, I, I I talked a little bit uh, early on uh, about some of the the value framework that we put in place to to guide our um, our approach to the overall budget, and that applied to the to the proposals on uh, the the levy program in particular. And and just really quickly, that those um, those were about uh, equity centered recovery process, so minimizing impacts on BIPOC community, um, the maintaining our staff capacity to to uh, for rapid recovery efforts, really addressing our safety and infrastructure uh, challenges, um, the climate change uh, piece, also maximizing our federal and state funding opportunities, so proje projects and programs that already had grants associated with them, and then um, pausing discrete projects to maintain our flexibility within some of the larger programs to direct those resources and investments um, to, to places that we might be helpful in terms of recovery or, or uh, maybe smaller scale changes. Um, we also, within this levy program, this is the four year uh, look at, at the budget, um, had to look at the timing of when projects or, or programs would be ready for investment. Um, so this really boils down a lot of that complexity into just some changes at the high move Seattle levy categories. On Tuesday, we're gonna go into a lot more detail with 
the levy oversight committee and are happy to share that information and, and presentation as well with with the with the full council um, and that talks about how these uh, changes affect individual programs within the levy there's 30 31 discrete programs within these three big categories um, uh, that also feeds into our levy assessment process. So we had to do some of this in the context of these rapidly changing um, revenue projections. Uh, and again, really the local dollars that go to support the larger levy program. Um, but there is an opportunity working in partnership with the levy oversight committee and our transportation equity work group on the a levy assessment where we can, we can um, see if those are the right uh, initial proposal that we've made too. And um, some of those may need to come back to the council um, for if, if there's uh, larger changes in allocations across these move Seattle levy categories. Um, some of them are have to go to the, the levy oversight committee uh, for approval. And, and that's a place where we're happy to stay connected and engaged with the, the full council and the transportation utilities committee as we move forward. Okay, thank you so much for that. We'll look forward to some more information uh, from your conversation on Tuesday then. I am not seeing any additional hands or messages here from folks who um, have questions at this point. Uh, Director Zimbabwe, uh, we know that there will be some more questions in the future as this is a huge component of not just the budget, but uh, the values and the priorities of this council um, to make sure that we have safe inf infrastructure. So uh, thank you very much. Councilmember Peterson, any other closing comments from you? Thank you, Chair Mosqueda. No, I don't have any further questions at this time. Thank you. Director Zimbabwe, anything from you? I think I've spoken enough. Thank you very much. All right. Well, thank you. Thanks again, Chris. And please pass on our appreciation to your team for working on this presentation for us and all the work that went into crafting the budget uh, on your end this, this summer. I think a few of them are watching. So thank you for thanking oh, them as well. Yeah. Well, have a good weekend. Appreciate Thanks. it. You too. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, colleagues, we are on our last presentation. And as I spoke to Councilmember Juarez about saving the best for last Director Aguirre from yeah. Seattle, <laughs> Seattle Parks and Recreations. Madam Clerk, can you please read item number four into the record? Agenda, agenda item four, Seattle Parks and Recreation for briefing and discussion. Wonderful. Well, we have with us Director Jesus Aguirre and um, Director of the uh, Superintendent of the De Department of Parks and Recreation. Uh, Michelle Finnegan and Amy Williamson uh, Williams from S uh, SPR as well. And Ben Noble, we are almost done. You've been with us for three days. Appreciate Director Noble for you being with us as well here on this last presentation. Um, before we begin, Councilmember Juarez, you are the proud chair of the <laughs> committee that has Parks and Recreation. Would you like to say some opening comments? Yeah, I have a few. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, is Tracy Ratcliffe with us as well from, from Central Staff? Yes, I see her on the line. Okay, good. Um, well, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, because uh, we've had this really wonderful, consistent, and continued communication with the superintendent, um, a lot of what we're going to, well, what he will share today, what we've looked at, isn't going to be completely new except for some of the, um, the specific uh, numbers. Uh, we've had a chance to go through the PowerPoint, the 12-page PowerPoint, and I would only add that for us, um, what we were looking at, and for our colleagues to pay particular attention to anyway, is the emphasis on the ads, the reductions, and the cost-saving measures on, number one, the operating budget, which I believe is slide six and has about nine areas that we've talked to. We've been, a lot of those areas we've, we've, we've spoken to um, since we've been in quarantine, lockdown, um, and the, uh, the issues and uh, the weekly reports that we've been given. And then the capital budget, which is slide eight, which is eight areas. And so in regards to that, what we were focused on was um, the general fund, REIT, and in particular, the Metropolitan Park District. And as you know, the MPD governing board is also the Seattle City Council. And I, I may have some comments on that when we get to slide 10 and 11. But my particular interest, and I'm sure the superintendent will address it, is the general fund and the MPD realignment, the park fund and the NPD realignment. Um, I just, I do want to add just to kind of more of on a personal note that in addition, um, 
I think it's important for this body to remember that due to the unprecedented emergency, we have reduced our financial commitments to Seattle Parks and Recreation below previous commitments and levels, um, as every department across the board has. And um, as resources bounce back, we do need to revisit and honor those commitments. Uh, we received uh, many emails and uh, comments about people concerned about how we're going to maintain previous commitments from the Metropolitan Park District a budget um, and in the operating and in the capital. Uh, finally, um, I want to appreciate the focus and seriousness for the department on being anti-racist and equally cent uh, equity-centered. I believe that is the quote. As chair of the Parks Committee, I have witnessed the attention to detail when providing services to our vulnerable populations in our city, especially during COVID. When we needed free childcare for essential workers, the city and the park was there. When we needed space, parks set up their community centers immediately, particularly to um, offer services for our unsheltered. My, as I shared before, my weekly meetings with the superintendent have been helpful to track and stay up to date with park activity to keep our parks and facilities safe and accessible. So today I do look forward to the superintendent's presentation and comments and questions from my colleagues. And just in briefly, um, I may have some comments in regards to the October 19th public hearing that we'll have. And of course, the November 23rd Metropolitan Park District Board meeting, which will be the first meeting for some of our newer members on council to see how that, um, what the voters passed, I believe in 2014, for the parks. And so um, with that, I will turn it over to Superintendent Aguirre. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, Councilmember Juarez, for your support. Um, and council members recognizing that it's Friday afternoon and we're that even though we are the best, you saved us for last, but I know that there's <laughs> folks who are probably um, a little tired. So I'll try to go through uh, somewhat quickly, but but there's a lot of information here and I want to make sure that I'm able to answer questions and, and try to provide with you, you with an overview. So um, I, I really appreciate the time. We're going to talk about the mayor's proposed 2021 budget for Santa Parks and Recreation. Uh, but also want to take some time to talk a little bit about our 2020 uh, budget because on Tuesday as the mayor submitted her 2021 budget, we also sent to you some additional changes uh, to our 2020 budget that are related to um, additional revenue uh, challenges with our park fund. Uh, and as, before I jump in, I also want to mention that on, on the call or on this virtual table, we also have Michelle Finnegan, who's our policy director, who oversees the development of the budget, as well as Amy Williams, uh, who she and her team do all of the work uh, behind in front and below the scenes to make sure all of these numbers add up. Um, so I'll go ahead and, and um, jump into the uh, the slides here. Um, you know, as as the council member stated, and and um, you know, we we've been doing work that's very different this year than than in previous years, as as everyone else has. Uh, some of you may recall that that Seattle Parks and Recreation started our year uh, really at, at, at a really the precipice of a really exciting time. We were about we had just adopted our strategic plan that was going to guide uh, our decision making over the next six to 12 years. And then we were about to kick off uh, a public engagement process that was going to develop the next six year financial plan for our park district. Uh, in fact, we'd already held our very first public meeting uh, before the, the governor's stay at home order. So not to go into uh, again into the detail of, of all of uh, what 2020 has brought us, uh, you know, the, the pandemic, the collapse of the economy, the civil rights reckoning, um, and, and even the infrastructure reckoning that we were brought into with Pier 58 uh, that was mentioned earlier. But um, just like other, other, other um, agencies, we, we, when we, when we um, jumped into this COVID response, we pivoted our operations. And so uh, in support of uh, the Human Services Department, we set up um, uh, shelters in three of our community centers to support our homeless population. Uh, we also uh, opened up uh, five free shower sites to, to provide that service to folks. Uh, we created and set up um, child care for, for folks, the, 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 our neediest communities, um, and continue to do that. We did that in the spring, we did it in the summer, we're continuing to do it now as the school district has, has set up their, their virtual uh, programming. Uh, we continue to ensure that all of our outdoor comfort stations in Santa Can stayed open and, and clean, and we continue to clean them on an enhanced level. Uh, and then, of course, we were really focused on keeping our parks open, recognizing that uh, parks and open space and green space is really critical 
um, for, for our communities, especially when, when we're all locked down and, and it's inc incredibly important for our, our physical and mental well-being. Uh, and then we also wanted to support our, our most uh, impacted communities, for example, our seniors who from the very beginning were not able to come out of their homes uh, and our special populations folks. So we, we did a lot of virtual programming for those folks who were most um, highly impacted by uh, the pandemic. Um, and, and it's also important to note that much of this work was done with a significantly diminished team. Uh, we're carrying over 130 vacancies. We've got over almost 100 staff members who are still not able to come to work because they're in high risk categories. Uh, and and I, I'd be remiss in, in not take advantage of a quick opportunity to, to really thank the, the, the team, the Seattle Parks and Recreation employees who every day uh, in such difficult situations, step up and do the things that I talked about, but just generally keep our system going and serving community. And they do that each and every day. So I'm really proud to be a part of this team. Um, so as we did this, um, you know, we, we provided these critical services and, and then of course had to begin to uh, uh, address the significant gaps, uh, particularly with our park fund. Um, and this is, you know, in terms of our 2020 um, uh, additional uh, uh, information that you're getting. Um, just to, to, to sort of quickly to, to give you an overview, our budget is, consists of general fund money, which is about 40%. 20% uh, of our budget is our park fund, which is generated from fees and, and charges for programs and rentals and things like that. We have 17% of our budget is REIT and then 21% is the park district. Uh, and of course, this park district has been uh, an incredibly uh, flexible source of funding that has allowed us to actually weather what are tremendous and significant um, revenue and, and, and funding gaps. Um, and, and so again, in, in, as we did in 2020, the revised budget that, that you acted on recently, uh, we did the same thing for the second package um, that are specific to this revenue loss for the parks, um, the park fund. Um, and, and similarly, you know, we, 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 um, uh, really relied on the park district, and I'll go into those. I'll go into those details here. Um, oh, okay. So, more specifically, again, this is our 2020 uh, rebalancing of the uh, of the uh, park fund. Um, our budget for 2020 originally assumed about 40 million dollars in revenues in this fund, and of course, because of the impact of COVID-19, um, we're estimating a significant shortfall there to the tune of 19.2 million dollars. Uh, you know, much of our work at Seattle Parks and Recreation is bringing people together, creating activities for folks, uh, uh, permitting uh, our facilities, and of course that came to a screeching halt in March. Um, and in addition to that, uh, we, we've, we've uh, provided hundreds of refunds to folks who had already reserved and paid for activities. Uh, and then we also participated in the mayor's uh, initiative to support our small businesses and, and our own partners by providing rent waivers and deferrals for the folks that are in our buildings um, and, and really looking for other ways to support our partners. So that revenue shortfall was pretty significant. As you can see by the chart here, uh, the way we're, we're proposing to address it is through some savings, uh, these vacancies that I mentioned, uh, reducing our overall uh, use of uh, temporary labor and other, no, no, other sort of non-labor uh, savings. We also, on the, on the positive side of things, we re re received $2 million from CARES funds to support our social distance ambassador program, which is a brand new program that was stood up uh, during the pandemic to support uh, keeping our parks open. And then we also received seven million dollars in um, general fund support. Uh, the remaining um, six point nine million dollars, um, we're proposing to 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 meet that gap with park district further park district realignment. Which, again, some vacancies in the park district, uh, some reductions in programming, which were already reduced for twenty twenty, given uh, the 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 health restrictions uh, that COVID is creating in terms of the number the groupings and things like that. Uh, and then we're also proposing continuing to defer certain capital projects. Uh, on this list, I'll call out, call out a couple. Um, one, you'll see saving our, our forests. This is a, um, a line item that supports our Green Seattle partnership. And, and I know we'll have more of an opportunity to talk about that uh, as with our budget, we also submitted a statement of legislative intent that gives you uh, sort of an update on where we are with that program and some of the changes and some of the modifications that we need to make to that program. Uh, I'll also call out on this chart another another one that that I think is important to to raise because it's it's 
uh, consistent and some of the other things we've done. Uh, you'll see here that the Smith Cove uh, phase one project is being put on hold as part of this proposal. Uh, and, and, you know, th these decisions are incredibly difficult and, and we made these decisions, particularly on, well, on all of them, but in, in our capital uh, reductions, this is in line with our other land bank uh, approach to other land bank sites. We put most of those on hold. Uh, we did carve out a few that specifically serve BIPOC communities uh, as part of the program, the plan that you approved uh, here a few weeks ago. And, and so Smith Cove is one that, that uh, we, we are proposing to, to push out. Um, and so, you know, and the other thing I'll note on, on these various programs, uh, most of these programs actually have some funding remaining in them. And, and so, for example, the, the uh, Arts in the Park, Urban Park Partnerships, et cetera, those are programs where we provide funds to community-based organizations to create activities to support our mission. Of course, those activities that they provide can't happen during the COVID pandemic, given that we're still in, in uh, the, you know, phase two of, of uh, uh, startup. So, so uh, many of those were holding vacancies, but many of those are activities that wouldn't be able to happen anyway. Um, so I, I can, I can uh, answer any specific questions on this slide or, or I can keep going. I know folks are probably tired. We are excited about parks. Very excited and totally, um, totally hope yeah. you are willing to engage with our questions here. I see Council Member Strauss and then Council Member Juarez. Did you uh, have a question on the slide as well? No, I'm just so excited about parks. So thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Don't, don't let the day or the time confuse you. Uh, we are more than enthusiastic about this. And I see Council President as well. Council, Council Member Strauss, please take it away. Thank you, Chair and Superintendent. I, you summed it up very well. None of these are easy decisions uh, in these tough times. And so I I so appreciate the hard choices that you've had to make already. I was hoping that you could tell us a little bit more about uh, the saving our forests line item. Um, and then while I understand that we need to put Smith Cove back on pause, I will share with you, I still do have the photograph from, I think it was Mayor McGinn. There was uh, Dow, uh, so many, you know, some from so many years ago when this park was supposed to, to be started up, uh, I'll pledge to you, I'll continue to save this photograph in my office until we take the next one. Um, and just understand that it's a hard decision that has to be made. Thank you. I appreciate that. And, and uh, I can't wait for us to take another photo, uh, hopefully soon. Uh, in, in terms of your question about saving our forest, so, so um, the 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 line item here is 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 you know so sorry the same word forest is part of what funds our green seattle partnership our green seattle partnership uh, program is about restor restoring our urban forest there are both operating and capital costs associated with that um what what we're we're proposing here is is just i think a couple of vacancies that are being held uh within one of our tree crews but but again as i mentioned at the beginning our our green seattle partnership really is is at a point where we are, have learned a ton uh, during the initial more than a decade that we were working on it and sort of have to have to re uh, kind of uh, reimagine it a little bit to, to make sure that it, it catches up with what we've learned about forest restoration what we've learned about what it costs to do these things and and, and of course now with uh, some budget reductions um, but that doesn't in any way shape or form indicate that we're not uh, that we don't remain absolutely committed to our urban forests and particularly as it supports our larger environmental footprint here and making sure that we're uh, doing our part to try to mitigate some of the climate change. Thank you. I, as you know, I have a keen interest in our urban canopy and if there's anything that I can do or if you want to put me to work on some trails, I've had some had some forestry work in my past and we'd be happy to join you. Great to know that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Council Member Strauss. Uh, Council President Gonzalez. Thank you so much, Chair uh, Mosqueda. Um, Superintendent Aguirre, I wanted to ask you really quickly about the $3.3 million one-time park fund expenditure savings. So it lists there um, that that's sort of a, a savings from vacancies, uh, temporary labor, other non-labor savings. Um, I wanted to ask about something that's been a priority for me that's actually in uh, Council Member Strauss's uh, district, District 6, um, last year, um, and I think the previous year I had advocated for um, park ambassadors for Ballard Common Parks and also um, 
and also the the Portland Lou in that place and um, Councilmember Bagshaw at the time um, was a, a real ally in my desire to see those um, those services funded. I do recognize that I, I I believe if I recall those were temporary labor positions and so just just wanted to get an understanding if that th that is going to be impacted or if that is impacted um, by this three point three million dollar line item here. Um, I'll have to get you a specific, a more specific answer to this. I, I think part of, uh, so these definitely are, as you said, the vacancies and the reduced uh, temporary labor. Um, I don't know specifically if that line item at Ballard Commons is impacted by this, but I can get you that answer. Right, I appreciate it. Um, I, I, we've obviously, I, I think, you know, it continues to be a, a high priority for me and um, uh, would appreciate knowing a little bit more granular um, detail um, if if that is going to be impacted, I'd like to to work with you all to figure out if there's an uh, alter alternative approach there to to meet the ongoing um, needs at Ballard Common uh, Ballard's Common Park as it relates to um, hygiene needs yep. and park ambassador uh, needs, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, and then lastly, I would just say I totally understand the decisions you have to make around um, savings to offset park fund. You know, same same goes for Seattle Department of Transportation presentation that we, we just heard. We're, we're having to make really difficult decisions here, and it's important for us to see the forest through the the, the forest through the trees, right? And making sure that we are um, keeping our eye on the prize in terms of making sure that we. Um, can come back to these really important projects that we've begun is, is, is I'm sure um, a shared priority there. Um, that being said, I'm sure that uh, former council member Sally Bagshaw um, screamed somewhere in district seven, um, <laughs> just, just without even knowing that we've mentioned Smith Cove uh, phase one delay. So um, I know that was a high uh, priority for her and a legacy project for her and um, and uh, really sincerely hope that we can we can um, get back to finally getting that across the finish line. But absolutely understand that these are difficult decisions, and 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 I understand what is fueling the the, the sort of filters that you're applying here um, that necessitate that delay. Thank you. And and actually, just to go back to your question about Ballard Commons, both because of all these smart people listening and and sending me information, but also reminding myself that 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 we're still in the middle of a pandemic. So a lot of the work at Ballard Commons, the activation we can't do right now for one, uh, but but the, these are one time costs. So so um, sorry. Either way, that 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 line item is not impacted by these reductions. We just can't do the activation. Yeah, um, I appreciate that, and I know that some of the some of the activation work was specifically tied to the the impacts related to some of the unsheltered population that that lives um, in and near the park, and so I wanted to make sure that um, that that we are reconciling um, what the true purpose is of those services, um, which are a little different than just um, activation for recreation purposes, but but uh, happy to have ongoing conversations um, with you all about that. Thank you. Uh, should I go on, uh, Chair Moskova? Yes, and I want to let you know, I, I'm not kidding. I'm getting messages from people saying, yay, parks, exclamation point, and it's not coming from Councilmember Juarez. I mean, that's- Yes, it is. <laughs> no, I mean, it is plus her. So um, yes, please continue. We're excited about this presentation and I really appreciate you being our grand finale here. Great, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, okay, so so then moving on to, to 2021. Um, so our 2021 budget, when we when we prepared this, still assumes that there's a, an ongoing COVID-19 uh, emergency and that we're going to continue to provide response there with some of the activities. Also assumes that there's going to be ongoing reductions and limitations in the recreation and social gathering activities that we can put together. Uh, but more importantly, uh, still assumes that the, the, the needs of our communities are significant and will continue to increase. And so the way we framed and created a 2021 budget recognizes all of these things, recognizes that our work uh, at Seattle Parks and Recreation really supports communities. And, and what we really focused on was trying to maintain that operational capacity. And that's why you'll see much of our um, mitigating losses, or excuse me, the, 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 yeah, the revenue losses and some of the reductions 
is pushing out some of our capital projects because you know again you know the the, the we're a people focused uh, organization and we want to make sure that we can continue to serve the the our community especially as we begin to be able to ramp up um so i'll go into more detail but but just to give you a broad overview of how significant the reductions for 2021 are for us um we we those reductions include an 11 point film 11.4 million dollar reduction uh, in our general fund, uh, which we're offsetting by uh, funding realignments with the park district uh, to the tune of 8.9 million, as well as some 1.3 million dollar um, uh, reductions in spending, uh, and then shifting some some of our debt service payments from uh, general fund to REIT. Uh, in addition to that, that 11.4 million general fund reduction, we also have a 19.3 million dollar REIT uh, reduction. Uh, and then just like I mentioned, I just went over for 2020 in terms of our park fund uh, in 2021, we're anticipating a further park, uh, park fund revenue gap of, of $10.5 million. We, we expect it to be better, uh, but I will say a caveat here is that we, we built this budget on the assumption that uh, at, during 2021, we're going to be in some form of a phase three reopening. Um, and, and when we did this, uh, the phase three reopening would have allowed us to begin to bring gatherings together of 50 people or less. Uh, we would have been able to open our buildings to the capacity of 50% or less. Of course, those have now changed. Uh, so the gatherings are 10 or less and the buildings are 25% or less capacity. So um, unfortunately, uh, that means that these, these, uh, these projections will likely uh, not bear, bear, come to bear then, and, and the picture might look worse. Um, so I want to make sure that, that, that I, I'm completely upfront transparent about that. Um, let me go on to the, to the next slide. Um, I, I, I do want to, before we dig more deeply into the numbers, um, I think, as I mentioned, we are a people-centered organization and, and our focus really is about serving our neediest people. Um, and, and our organization really, as Council Member Juarez has stated at the beginning, we really are focusing on, on uh, being, becoming and being an anti-racist equity centered organization through our work. You know, we're, we've tried to do that through, through our response uh, in 20, for, to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic in 2020, but as well as our 2021 planning and, and our planning beyond. Um, not to state the obvious, but this crisis, uh, like probably every crisis, uh, disproportionately impacts our communities of color. And, and we anticipate that, uh, particularly with, with the work that we do, that whatever priorities were emerging prior to this crisis and all of this, these exciting conversations we're having as part of the strategic planning process that we're in the middle of, we know that these priorities are gonna radically change and continue to change. And, and, and especially as the impacts of these, these multiple crises, frankly, um, deepen even further in our low, low income communities. Um, so, so that has, of course, uh, required us to, to look at how we make these decisions and, and applying uh, uh, racial equity analysis, both the short term and long term funding decisions, obviously it goes into the uh, picking which capital projects we put on hold and which we try to continue. Uh, it goes into how we're leveraging the, the reduced footprint resources to try to program as much as we can. Uh, and it'll be absolutely critical as we think about not just the rest of the biennium, but really um, as we go into the next, uh, the planning for the next cycle of the park district. Uh, again, this has proven to be an incredibly um, flexible and, and, and helpful uh, source of funds for us. But as we emerge from a, this emergency, we're going to have to have some really um, difficult and deep conversations about how we continue to serve our most vulnerable communities. Uh, at Parks and Recreation, uh, as I said, we really are focused on becoming an anti-racist uh, equity center department. Uh, we do that. Race is really at the foundation, but we also recognize um, that, that intersect intersectionality uh, plays a significant part uh, in, in the levels of marginalization, particularly for our BIPOC community. So uh, our budget is, was built within that context. Uh, we've made lots of very difficult decisions. We've used modified racial equity toolkits to really dig into these decisions to really guide all of our staff uh, at every level to, to, to think about um, how, how to embed racial equity in, in every policy program and budget decision that we make and our workforce decisions. We've got a lot of work to do, but we're, we're continuing to work on that. Um, I'll, I'll speak a little bit more about in, in our budget, um, there are going to be impacts to our operations and, and some of the reductions, uh, both required by COVID-19 because of our ability to bring people together, but also 
um, because of some of the funding here uh, will will uh, result in, in a reduction in activities and facilities available to the public. For example, our community centers, we can't open them back up even in a phase three to the extent that they were before. Uh, we've we've uh, taken advantage of the fact that there's five community centers, for example, that are um, uh, undergoing, uh, they still have funding for, for CIP projects that were in place uh, before the pandemic hit, they continue to be funded. Um, those, will, those will remain closed for, for the, likely the entirety of the year, but recognizing that in some of those communities, there's a great need for programming. So we will provide additional alternative programming in those communities during those closures and, and have already been piling some of that during the summer. Uh, you know, I mentioned our pools, uh, our pools generate a lot of revenue um, given again the restrictions, the health restrictions for, of COVID-19, as well as the, the loss of revenue tied to those restrictions and, and the, our, our inability to bring people in there, uh, we won't be able to open all 10 of our pools. We'll, we'll actually be planning on opening just five of our pools. As we make that decision, of course, um, we want to make sure that we, those pools serve communities of color. And so we haven't made those final decisions, but likely it'll be pools like Rainier Beach, Southwest Teen Life Center, uh, probably Meadowbrook here in the north side to really serve uh, a lot of the community, particularly up in Lake City, uh, and then Medgar Evers in um, the Central District. Uh, and, and we'll also focus on dedicating uh, as much as we can of our scholarship money for, for scholarships for swim lessons, uh, allowing uh, families to register for that, because we know there's such a, a disparate impact uh, particularly of, of drownings, et cetera, for, for communities of color. And we want to make sure that we don't continue to, to, to exacerbate that. Um, I talked a little bit about how we think about uh, equity in, in our capital planning. And, and again, we're prioritizing these diminished resources. We're making really, really hard decisions and we know they impact communities um, and, across the city and particularly those communities that have been working hand in hand with us to advocate and further develop uh, these projects for many, many years, as, as the council member shared a picture from many years ago, um, and we'll continue to do that. Uh, but but uh, we've made those hard decisions by focusing on BIPOC communities. So for example, uh, the land bank sites that are continuing um, are the sites at South Park, uh, the site at the IDCC, and, and the North, North Rainier site. Um, again, those are those are tough decisions, but we're, we're working to, to do the best that we can. Um, yep. Just before you move off of the slide, um, I know that the subsequent slides are going to get into some more of the line item reductions um, and where some shifts are occurring. Uh, but specific to using our anti-racist lens, um, we're really, as Councilmember Wara said, we're really proud and uh, appreciative of the work that you and the frontline workers have done specific to childcare and making showers and sh um, shelter space available in your community centers, given that there is higher numbers of uh, people of color working as essential workers and needing additional childcare, given that there's higher numbers of people of color represented in our unsheltered population needing shelter and, and showers. Um, can you just at a broad overview, do give us a little bit of a preview of whether or not in 2021, there's increased capacity in the budget for showers and sh uh, showers um, through showers and shelters through your community centers, and if there's increased capacity for childcare relative to this year. Um, in terms of the 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 capacity question, so the showers we're going to continue to operate the site that we've been operating. So we we have five sites that operate uh, across the city: um, uh, Miller, Del Ridge, Meadowbrook, Rainier, and Green Lake. Um, unfortunately, the, the Green Lake uh, site will have some reduced capacity just because there is a CIP project happening there. We're re replacing some of the boiler systems and air handling. We've worked with SPU as part of the, the, their clean program to set up a mobile shower there. Uh, we'll have it there at least three days a week, but, but um, I think it was normally open four or five days a week. Uh, in terms of the in terms of the child care and the ongoing support for for our essential workers, you know we're continuing to work uh, on those in in partnership with Deal. Um, currently, we're operating uh, both child care, school age child care, as well as we've set up some teen hubs to support our our, our teenagers who are uh, who might be struggling with the virtual programming that the school district is offering. Uh, uh, providing staff support as well, some access to, to, to internet connectivity, et cetera. Um, in terms of whether that's increasing or decreasing, you know, I, I think much has to, to do with, with sort of where we end up in our ability to operate 
other kinds of programs. Our childcare, we're anticipating it should continue. Um, right now, we, we're the sites that we're offering childcare in the school age childcare are actually under enrolled, um, and we're sort of assessing whether we're able to try to consolidate some of those groups so we can continue to, to provide access to that uh, for a longer period. Um, I'm, I'm, I apologize. I'm, I'm not sure if I answered your question. I forgot what I was saying. So. <laughs> I think the takeaway was that um, at the very least, it's maintenance, maintenance yeah. of the yeah. five um, shower facilities. And to the degree that there's capital projects, you're going to move in a, um, a trailer for at least three days. On the child care, it sounded like um, because of decreased enrollment, there might be some consolidation. But on both of those fronts, it didn't sound like there was a planned increase for 2021. No. Okay. No. I, I colleagues, oh, please go ahead, Dr. Sorry, no, I, I want to respond to that. You also mentioned uh, sheltering. And, and so sheltering for us is we, we support the overall sheltering strategy that HSD puts together uh, in, in regular emergencies, winter weather, et cetera, as well as uh, we've done so during this pandemic. So we are, we are poised to continue to do that. In fact, as we do our planning and we selected the sites for childcare, for example, um, we, we do our best to, to, to not have childcare at the sites that we anticipate might become shelters because they have historically, because I think that is also a need that we were trying to match. So we're trying to find the right balance uh, for the limited space that we have. That's, that makes a lot of sense. Um, colleagues, I have been trying to be co uh, conscious of how many items I signal interest in in this role this year, trying to limit those uh, items um, on my uh, priority list. I've already talked about um, the interest in looking at the possibility of Health One van being added to um, the current proposal. And I would also like to signal interest in continuing to provide additional childcare capacity. I know that there's a number of council members um, who are interested in this. So I look forward to working with all of you, um, with Councilmember Juarez, given that this is in your department, Council President Gonzalez, that this is also um, in your purview with early learning and Councilmember Strauss, I know you've taken some leadership roles on expanding um, permitting access to childcare. This is, I think, a big priority for our entire council. So uh, we will look forward to hearing more about the lessons learned in terms of um, capacity and space if they are less um, full than you anticipated. But we know that all of the national reports continue mm -hmm. to say that without access to childcare that's accessible throughout our community right now, we will not be able to recover um, economically. And so this is a big priority and just wanted to signal my interest in not just maintaining the status, but seeing how we can increase and looking at various partners to do that with. And, and if I may, uh, just, just a little more on the childcare, I guess I'll do two things. Maybe take advantage and, and, and uh, do a little bit of a commercial and let families know that we still have space and folks should come register. And in fact, we still have scholarship money available for the communities, who, for the families who need that. Um, we have seen that even though we're under enrolled, we know that the need is there because uh, and particularly our focus on serving the, the students that are furthest from educational justice, uh, we have a, a larger proportion of the families that are participating now that are receiving scholarship than we normally do in, in a regular school age care program. So we know that the need is there and we know that folks are taking advantage of it. So please, if, if you need it, uh, come and register. So. Thank you. And we will yeah. follow up with you. I'd love to push that information out through our council, right. council channels as well. So if we could get the um, info on that, that'd be great. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Council May I continue? Anderson. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you, Chair Mosqueda. Um, I just wanted to thank the superintendent and his team at Parks for, regarding this slide, for recognizing um, who is living at Magnuson Park. Um, there was a recent uh, census done of the two um, affordable housing projects there, and it is 69.1% um, BIPOC. And so I, I just want to appreciate his attention not, you know, to Magnuson Park, not only as a regional asset, but also just the residents who are, who are living there and uh, need access to um, programming there at the park. Thank you. Thank you. Shall I continue? Yes, please. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so, so then, you know, digging into, into the, the actual numbers here, I, I let me make sure I didn't skip. Yeah. Um, and so, so this, this slide is, is, I think council member Peterson talked about the apples and oranges. So there's a lot happening here. It's very, very high level. There's lots and lots of um, uh, lines that, that go into this. 
Um, on this slide, maybe I'll, I'll rather than try to go in and, and, and understand some of these apples and apples comparisons, I do want to highlight a couple things here. Um, one thing of note here, the full-time equivalence line you'll see uh, is, is almost the same. We, we're, we're, we really focused on keeping our work for, workforce intact, uh, even though we're holding many vacancies. Uh, we have one position that we're abrogating as part of this entire process, and this is a position that was vacant, um, one of our volunteer coordinator supervisors. Uh, and then the other thing I'll highlight here is, is the reduction in REIT. Uh, we've got a pretty significant reduction read over the entire CIP plan. I'll get into more detail there. Uh, but uh, if, if I may, I'd like to start going into some of the detail unless folks have specific example of questions on this higher level. Okay. Um, similarly here, I, you know, I can, I can, we can, I and the team can answer specific questions. So uh, as we mentioned, our approach to the 2021 budget was, was both about capturing savings through the efficiencies, reductions and vacancies, and then mitigating ongoing uh, one-time revenue issues and uh, through realignments of the park district. So these next few slides, as the other agencies go through, there's ads reductions and cost savings. Um, and then after these, I'll go through some of the realignments um, similar to what we've done in 2020. So um, again, I'm happy to answer specific questions. There are some efficiency, uh, some savings captured from efficiencies in a couple of our, of our uh, divisions. Uh, most of these are, are uh, looking at uh, non-labor costs Etc. Um, but I can continue unless there are specific questions on these. I don't see any hands. Thank you so much. And is it, it? I think it's fair to say that there's not an overall FTE elimination for parks. So that's Correct. a fair assumption in each of these lines. Okay. Thank you. Correct. There, there. The total is one FTE right now that we're eliminating. Again, we've got lots of vacancies that are contributing to the savings that that, that are helping us meet these shortfalls. But that's correct. Um, this next slide again, uh, I, I can I can uh, go into any detail. I, I, I will maybe I will call out. So I, line six here talks specifically about that one FTE, uh, our volunteer coordinator supervisor um, who who was managing a three person volunteer program unit. So that those functions are moving over to someone else. We're eliminating that position, capturing the savings there. Uh, I will note uh, line item five here. Um, is is uh, more of an operational change that does capture some savings. Uh, you may know Alki Community Center is a pretty small community center that is adjacent to the Alki Elementary School. Uh, technically, it's classified as a full service community center, but really primarily it, it provides uh, child care and early learning. And, and what this change does is officially move it away from being a full service community center to a child care hub. Uh, shouldn't change much uh, from the programming standpoint, but that allows us to reallocate some staff a little bit. The facility will still be available for rentals and things like that, but it's just a change that, um, you know, uh, hopefully you'll see that even though this is a small uh, recapture of funds, given the, the significant uh, challenges we've had, every, every penny counts for us. So wanted to highlight a couple of those. Um, moving on to, to this slide, and so, so this slide, um, again, goes through, through both uh, some uh, reductions and, and, and cost saving measures in our park fund as well as some of the REIT money. Uh, on this one, I'll highlight, uh, particularly with the REIT, there's significant reductions uh, that have caused, you know, we've talked about some of these capital projects, but also the, um, some of our, some of our uh, overall six year CIP programs have been either eliminated or reduced. The ones that are REIT funded, most of these have other funding uh, sources, but the REIT funding has been either eliminated or pushed out several years. Things like our comfort station renovations, boiler and mechanical systems, ball lighting replacement, things like that. Sort of these programs that we, we continue to do uh, sort of preventative maintenance on. Uh, some of those have been eliminated as in, in our six year CIP. Uh, others have been pushed out uh, again, just to try to try to um, make the numbers match and, and try to balance our budget. Um, let me. So uh, this slide uh, again. It, it's important to note here that even though for 2021 it doesn't show the specific reductions, but again, our REIT funding has been reduced for the entire CIP, the six-year CIP. I did want to call out a couple things here um, in terms of our REIT uh, that, that will impact communities. Um, the Queen Anne, uh, West Queen Anne Playfield Conversion Project uh, has been pushed out from uh, 2024. 
um, it will it will go out beyond. It will need to go out beyond the six year the six year CIP program, uh, and as well, some of our other major maintenance backlog projects uh, significantly have been reduced. I'll keep going unless you throw something at me, Chair That's great, Director Noble. Did you have something? I just wanted to comment that the the impacts on read um, reflect the fact that our forecast for read is down both for this year, for 2020 and for 2021 and in the out years. And the, the CIP is a six year planning document. So we're um, looking at the, the long run um, impacts there. And then in addition, I think I highlighted this in a, a sort of juxtaposition with the SDOT presentation. We were also directing a significant share of REIT um, into the repayment of uh, bonds issued for the con uh, for the repair or reconstruction of of the, the West Seattle Bridge. So there's, a two, there's both the revenue pressure and then there's the expenditure pressure. And, um, again, you just see this as an impact over the full six year CIP because uh, we're not expect we're expecting read to recover, but slowly over that whole period. Thanks, Dr. Noble. And hello, little, little, little. Yeah, noble. someone's a little under the weather today. <laughs> uh, welcome to the meeting. Thank you, so, Director. Thank you. Uh, again, I'll continue unless, unless folks have questions. But uh, so this, this now focuses on our uh, $11.4 million reduction in general fund. Um, again, same approach with some um, expenditure savings, vacancies, temporary labor, other non-labor reductions. Uh, I, I think I mentioned early on uh, that there's also a debt service swap uh, previously funded by general fund now being moved over to REIT uh, and then continuing with <clears throat> some of the, the uh, realignment of the park district. So here, um, uh, land bank sites, for example, this is, this is again opportunistic in that we uh, we put several land banks on hold as part of our 2020 budget. Uh, obviously, we don't need to maintain and operate them to the same level, so we recapture the $1.2 million here in savings uh, from the park district. Uh, we, we have reduced our park land acquisition program, uh, and, and it will now focus on, on um, acquiring more green spaces and, uh, sorry, green belts and natural areas, which tend to be lower in cost. But it does, you know, strategically, we, we are keeping uh, a staff person uh, on 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 the team to make sure that those relationships that that go into any land acquisition they take many years and many times they're opportunistic and we build relationships with with uh, homeowners and landowners who are interested in selling uh, so we're able to maintain those relationships so uh, we thought that was an important piece there uh, we also have have uh, reduced the major uh, projects challenge fund which is part uh, which is a grant program that is overseen by our park district oversight committee that program again was already uh, going to be re-envisioned with a much more equity uh, uh, centered uh, focus and and when we come back uh, hopefully very soon with a new park district uh, financial plan we expect that the new version of that uh, fund will be put in place uh, and then and then we're continuing to reduce major maintenance backlog and asset management uh, uh, programs within they're funded by the park district um, and, and again, we'll, we'll, you know, all of these reductions um, will cause us to, to, to once, once all of these things are approved, to go back and really look at our asset management program. And we're doing a lot of thinking internally about how we manage our buildings literally from, from the cradle to the grave, so to speak, so that we can continue to uh, both maintain these assets in a way that, so we don't lose them given the reduction in some of these programs, but also uh, looking at life safety, looking at um, uh, some of these buildings are literally falling apart, so we have to preserve the assets. Uh, looking at environmental uh, efficiencies, and then of course equity as we make these decisions. So our, our overall asset management uh, program will be uh, sort of right redone once we once we get through all of these uh, changes. Um, so uh, in terms of the 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 park fund, so in in 2020 we we uh, experience we're experience, we're expecting a 19.2 million dollar reduction in park fund. Uh, for 2021, uh, we were hoping for only a $10.5 million reduction, but as I mentioned, this was built on a phase three uh, uh, a scheme that has now changed, so um, we'll, we'll have to keep monitoring that very, very closely. Um, the way that we're, we're meeting this um, is, again, through a savings program. Uh, vacancies, temporary labor, and other non-labor within, within the programs that are funded by the Park Fund, uh, and then um, 
furthering uh, some of the some of the savings, one-time savings from park district realignment. Again, another another uh, saving our forest line item. You know, the arts and the parks, um, uh, the better programs for youth, etc. So these programs, I, I you know, I will say that that most of these are holding of, of vacancies. For example, the the uh, better programs for youth, uh, we're holding vacancies and and uh, stopping one of our quality assessment programs, but we're still continuing to do programs. So all of these line items still have some. Uh, funding available to try to further those the the um, intents of those programs, but of course, um, we're reducing them. And then and then the last one here uh, I'll note is um, the uh, waterfront, uh, central waterfront. Uh, is, is, it's basically uh, moving it out of the park district and and um, uh, funding it with other sources, REIT and other sources. Thank you very much. I don't see any questions on this. Okay. Well, um, th that's really the, the the gist of our budget. A again, very, very significant reductions in all of our funds, general fund, park fund, and of course, utilizing the park district. And I, and I will say, you know, I, I think we're, we're incredibly fortunate uh, uh, that that the, the voters and, and the, the elected officials have created this park district. I've had conversations with with my peers across the country who don't have situations like this, where they've had re significant reductions in staff and operations, and then will not be able to um, e emerge from this pandemic in the same way that I think we'll be able to emerge and really be able to focus um, our resources in our neediest community. So, in terms of next step for us, next steps for us, uh, as Councilmember Watt has mentioned at the beginning, and and I, I, I'll pause because I think she said she had some uh, questions or comments here, but. Uh, on October 19th, uh, we're, we're going to, you will be uh, presented with a city ordinance that will create an amendment to the interlocal agreement uh, between the city and the park district that would allow us to delay the planning uh, of this next six year cycle for a year um, based on emergency situations. And then there's the, the twin ordinance um, that um, authorizes this with the park district resolution. Um, and then we'll present to you an overview of the very specific park district uh, 2021 operating budget, <clears throat> excuse me. And then in, on November 23rd, um, we, we expect, uh, we, we will present to you um, a resolution that amends our 2020 park district budget to revise all the allocations. Uh, another another um, uh, ordinance that will, will suspend the, the general fund floor for 2021 that will, that will reflect some of the changes that we're proposing here. Um, and then a resolution to adopt our 2021 park district budget, uh, as well as in setting the property tax levy uh, level for 2021. Thank you, Councilmember Juarez. Thank you. Um, I actually was gonna talk about the October 19th Metropolitan Park District meeting. So thank you, uh, Superintendent, that we will indeed be holding a public hearing to consider the 2021 proposed budget and we will be taking up two amendments that would appropriately delay the 2021-2026 planning cycle. And again, I want to thank the superintendent and Tracy Ratcliffe for your guidance and keeping these things streamlined and organized, particularly for me and Nagin, because it gets real tricky. Um, and then of course, I'll just reiterate, um, after we vote on our 2021 budget on November 23rd, um, the Metropolitan Park District Board will then plan to vote. Um, we will then vote after we, we will vote as a, as the board after council uh, on the 2020 revised budget and the adoption of the 2020 budget at the same time. So this is standard after we vote on the regular budget, then we vote on the MPD budget. And this will happen on the same day that council adopts the city budget. Um, I just wanted to add that, um, ask the superintendent if he got together with Director Zimbabwe at SDOT and did their homework together because their PowerPoints look a lot alike. Um, format. Unfortunately, we, we <laughs> didn't. The, the, when I was watching his presentation, I was like, oh, we should have done that. We should have done that. So, so maybe, maybe we, we will next time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. As always, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam Chair.
Thank, thank you, Councilmember Juarez and Chair Parks. Um, I appreciate the reminder about the way in which the Parks District budget process overlaps with our budget. Um, as uh, the chair of public, as the chair of Parks knows, I was messaging her saying October nineteenth. Tell me more. So this <laughs> is a, a very good reminder, and uh, we will look to you to let us know um, how else we should be engaged and happy to support you all in any way on those efforts and. Thank you for the reminder about how this dovetails with our vote on the 23rd as well in November when we look to finalize the budget. Director Aguirre, is there any additional comments that you have? No, just other than ending with appreciation to all of you council members, uh, uh, Director Noble and his entire team, and then of course my team who really did all the work uh, in getting us to this budget that, that, that really made some tough decisions, but at the end of the day will allow us to really be able to uh, respond to these incredible needs of our communities as we as we start to emerge from this. Um, so no, thank you very much for the time. Absolutely, thank you for your time. Um, and I know you were on the presentation this morning as well. So we have taken all of your day today um, and wanna thank you and your team for this presentation and all of the work that you do. I know you mentioned your appreciation for your parks uh, team and all the frontline staff who've really stepped up in um, heroic ways during COVID to provide um, services to those who are most vulnerable in our community and most in need right now. So thank you um, to all of them as well uh, for their work. I also wanna echo what you just mentioned uh, thanks to Director Noble. Thank you for being with us uh, throughout the last three days, but more importantly, all of the work that you've done on this uh, proposed budget. We know that you've been working nights and weekends and um, have been doing so for months. And we hope that everybody has the chance to take a little bit of a breather this weekend and relax a little in the upcoming week. Um, Director Noble, hello, good to see you. Thank you again for all of your work and please do pass on our best wishes to your little one uh, with recovering from a little cough there. Yes, thank you uh, and appreciate the opportunity to be with you for the past few days um, and, and look forward to the next few weeks as well. Yeah, that sounds great. Thank you, Director Noble. Uh, folks, just as a reminder, we have all of our form A's or our issue identification forms that are due October 8th at 5 p.m. That is... Um, that is a Thursday next week. Uh, we also have our public hearing for this committee. That is Tuesday, October 6th at 5.30 p.m. We will try to take everybody who signs up. So um, if you are able to join us, that is tremendous. We appreciate your time in advance, colleagues, um, but understand that there's other obligations as well, and there's the opportunity to review any recorded public testimony, but it is helpful for us as we think about issue identification. The central staff presentations will identify potential budget items that um, you all flag in your form A's. This is the chance to flag for other council members what you have in terms of changes that you'd like to propose, additions that you'd like to propose, reductions, um, and ways that we would like to see the budget potentially change. And that is why it's so important that those issue identification forms get turned into central staff on time because they issue memos based on what you send them. <laughs> Thank you, Allie, for affirming that uh, on time again, October 8th at 5 p.m. Those memos are going to be generated for our review and deliberations during issue identification sessions, which are scheduled for October 15th and 16th, also on the 20th and the 21st. So we must get those form A's turned in on time. And if you have any questions, uh, please do reach out um, to Ali, myself, Patty. Again, uh, our office through Sage Parade Chief of Staff, we will be sending a memo around on Monday, just as a reminder to folks as we head into next week. It's been a long week. Uh, but we really uh, appreciate your time. Uh, thanks again to Patty for all of the work that they have done with sending out the forms and um, they'll be doing that again uh, with um, each of the uh, forms that are forthcoming in the upcoming month and a half. Uh, appreciate all that you guys have done, all that you all have done, and it's so important that we have these conversations in public, bring in the questions and concerns we've heard from residents throughout our communities, and that we continue to work together uh, collaboratively, ask tough questions, and, um, it, and really push for those answers as you all have done so that we can create a budget document that really reflects our values in the next uh, two months to be able to put something forward that we're all proud of. I appreciate all of your work. I don't see anybody raising their hand. 
Allie, please tell your central staff team, thank you for all of the work they've done so far. We look forward to working with you all. IT and communications and the clerks team, thank you for getting us through these last long three days. And with that, if there's no further comments, today's meeting is adjourned. Have a great weekend, everyone. See you on Monday at the council president's morning briefing. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.